Welcome to the One Fish Podcast. I'm Collis Stoll, president of One Fish Foundation, a sustainable seafood education nonprofit in Maine. Today, we're continuing our discussion about Bristol Bay, Alaska, and we're very fortunate to have Catherine Karskallen joining us from her home in Dillingham. A lifelong resident of Bristol Bay, Cat captains the Seahawk, which is a drift netter that primarily fishes for sockeye salmon. She literally grew up fishing for salmon, and she's dedicated much of her time in the past 15 years to protect the resource, her community, and her way of life from the pebble mine. Kat currently serves as executive director of the Commercial Fisherman for Bristol Bay and works closely with other organizations fighting to save Bristol Bay. So welcome, Kat. Thanks for joining us. I know how busy you are even though you're, you know, got off the boat a few weeks ago, but right now still your focus is all on the pebble mine. Um, and, you know, I was thinking about this the other day about when we first met, which was, I think 2014 or 2015 in Boston at Mark Titus's screening of The Breach, which was his first movie. Um, and then we got to reconnect a few months ago, a couple months ago, when Mark was uh, promoting his second movie, The Wild, both of them talking about preserving wild salmon habitat and specifically the, uh, the pebble mine. So it's kind of neat to see that sort of community building working, even if it's under unfortunate circumstances. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think we were, I mean, we've, we've talked a bit about just how long this fight's been going on and I try to look on the bright sides of it all because it, it really has been a good chunk of my life and many of our lives spent just trying to stop something from happening and trying to preserve what we have. And it's, it's easy to slip into like a little bit of a depressing mood about the amount of time, but at the same time that the community that we've built through all this and the connections we've made, I think, I mean, mentioning Boston, like I, I had never, my first trip out to Boston was in this effort to build the commercial fishermen for Bristol Bay coalition. And it, it was just incredibly eye-opening meeting fishermen out there with, you know, who participate in such different fisheries, but face the same struggles that we do. And, and it was really inspiring and just emotional to have them give us support with our issue and, and really highlight to me how lucky we are because their support came so freely from the fisheries on the East coast for a fishery that hasn't been impacted yet by industrial development or you know by by incompatible development in our region and and that i mean that was really touching to me and and then just like you said having met you in 2014 and then reconnecting again and and just seeing the the breadth of the coalition and and the people who really truly care about this and will never stop caring about it is is really touching i imagine that yeah touching and probably fortifying too you know it it probably adds to the drive to continue. Um, Cause I imagine there's times when it just feels, you know, overwhelming and you know, swimming up against a, um, a current that's pretty strong. Yeah, ab absolutely. I think um, someone we were reminiscing the other day about when, when this all started and it was, 2000, I mean, these, these minerals have been in the ground forever, obviously, and, and people have been considering development of them for quite a while, but I, this, this, you know, Northern Dynasty's involvement and, and the really digging at it and exploration started right the year I graduated from high school. And it, it started with Northern Dynasty executives coming out and holding community meetings. And, and really, I mean, the thing that stuck in so many of our minds from the very beginning was just their arrogance and their, you know, they, they said directly in those meetings, this is too big and too valuable. You will never stop this. This is how it's an inevitability. And, and they came to us in those meetings, just kind of, this is an inevitability. So let's, let's work together and make this happen. And you know, that, that rubbed everybody here the wrong way because it, it absolutely is not an inevitability, but it, it did in the beginning make us feel pretty small, just the, you know, the amount of money that they had and, and they brought in these huge investors. And meanwhile, we have 8,000 people in this region and we're trying to fight this really Goliath of a mine. And so the more our coalition builds and, and the fact that once someone's pulled in, they don't ever really leave, like they're, you know, 
caring about Bristol Bay doesn't doesn't seem to be something that's short term. It yeah, it is. It's very inspiring and and fortifies the fact that we this isn't an inevitability. And the more we build our coalition, the more we build support for Bristol Bay, the more likely we will be to prevail. Well, you know that's one thing you mentioned. You know this idea when when you visit Bristol Bay, it kind of sticks with you. Well, I can say that firsthand. Um, you know, from being there, not this past summer, but the summer before last, and um, going out to fish with Melanie Brown um, on, on her boat, and, and just, that was an amazing experience. And then going up into the creeks and fly fishing. And so here I am in Maine, and, you know, I'm carrying the standard as best I can. And I think that's, that's the point that we keep trying to get across is that, you know, what's happens in Bristol Bay has far reaching repercussions throughout the low, lower 48. Um, and we'll, we'll get back to that arrogant statement you were talking about in terms of the, you know, the, the people at Northern Dynasty and what came out on those tapes recently. But I wanna, before we get there, I wanna you know, talk a little bit about the fishing that you do. And you know, those four to six weeks you spend on the boat and you know that being one amazing way to just unplug from the heaviness of the pebble mine i'm assuming did, 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 can you tell us a little bit like what, what that is for you just the fishing i mean you were looking forward to it that a particularly this let's talk about this last season which was everything was confused um, and it was kind of up in the air with, you know, COVID hanging over it. So if you can give us sort of a description of going into that and what it was like to finally get on the boat. Yeah, yeah, it is, I mean, it, it even surprises me when I ever say that going commercial fishing is a great way to unplug or, or, or something, I guess a little bit of a break because it is, it's very intense and very hard. It's, I mean, it's, it's absolutely my profession and it's, it's not easy, but at the same time, it's, it's grounding because it's reliable and it's unreliability. Like it, it's, you know, we're, we're completely dependent, but it's, we're dependent on things that are controlled by nature and not humans right now anyway, you know, that our, our fishery is well managed. It's sustainable. It's, it's the largest wild sockeye runs remaining in the world. And as much as it's, there's so many ups and downs with the runs and, and, you know, it's completely unpredictable this year, the run was, late like very very late like later than it's ever been in my lifetime fishing and late enough to be scary but at the same time we because we know the fish are out there and we know the habitat that they're heading home to at no point did i think they weren't coming back so even even in just like a crazy year with with the lead up with covid and and a crazy run it's still it's still the kind of unpredictability that that's more comfortable than dealing with politics and a mining company that's working behind the scenes and you know all everything that comes along with with fighting this mine is it, it's it was really really nice to just reconnect and and get back to fishing and plug into something that's more familiar to me you know it's, mm -hmm. and and a lot of success is just driven by how hard you work and you know a lot of luck too but it's why i've stuck with fishing and and why i i mean i, I just I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to do that type of work, even if it is such a short period of time. Yeah, it's it's interesting me to me is that I've thought about it and talked to different you know fishermen up there, particularly, um, and you know that drive to go back year after year and endure whatever is coming your way. Um, I, I that that focus that singular focus is also probably part of what's instinctive to you to protect that resource to protect that way of life and to make sure that it's there for generations to come i imagine there's something that's sort of like it's almost like a wild a call of the wild kind of thing i don't know how to describe like what what made me so, so I like you said I, I grew up fishing my parents are both commercial fishermen and I was raised doing it and and at you know as a teenager I think it was it was it was just a job and it was the job that was available to me and um 
as I got older and realized my skill set and what I enjoyed doing, I, I realized like it was something that I wanted to pursue on my own and, and bought my own boat. But I, I think what's happened simultaneously with the threat of Pebble is, is I've realized more than just it's a job that I enjoy doing and it's, you know, it's something that I'm good at. It's also an incredible opportunity that we can't take for granted and, and something that's, that's worth fighting for. And I, I think that's, that's what I, that's what I definitely gained more of a perspective of just in, in forming this coalition and fighting the mine is, is realizing that Bristol Bay is home to the last great wild sockeye runs on the planet, but 500 years ago, Bristol Bay wasn't unique in the size of our runs. You know, we've, we've had salmon runs equal or greater in size up and down the East and West coast. And those have diminished, you know, for, for a million reasons, it's in a lot of areas, it's just been death by a thousand cuts In other areas it's been making bad decisions, like allowing a mine like Pebble to go through. But I think just realizing that we have the opportunity, I have the opportunity to not only participate in this fishery, but protect it and, and, you know, do right by it, allow it to not only feed my parents and myself and my cousins and their children, but generations and generations just keep, keep providing for a fishery that'll provide back to us. Because of your role with commercial fishermen for Bristol Bay and how involved you've been on this for so long, love to hear your perspective on the last few months um, and just the effort to try to keep up with it and then strategize you know, what the next steps are to effectively, you know, keep the campaign against the, the mine going. Yeah, well, it, it's absolutely been a whirlwind. I think we, you know, setting out for fishing this year, we knew that we were kind of heading off the grid and, and going to come back to, um, I mean, I, I was fully expecting a permit decision imminently post fishing and then a whole bunch of other things happened. And I, I think the, you know, just, seeing seeing some of the public bipartisan support for Bristol Bay in opposition to Pebble that that threw not a wrench in things but just yeah it kind of upset and and gave us some hope that maybe things weren't going to weren't a complete inevitability with Pebble getting their permit and I think the you know the letter Army Corps sent on August 24th rather than immediately issuing a permit to Pebble like we we had expected I think all year it's it's a bit of a delay in the process and, and gave a lot of us hope, but at the same time, I think the, the tapes that Pebble, that, that came out um, where Pebble was kind of caught on tape saying a lot of the things we have been assuming for the two years that Pebble's been participating in this permitting process, it just confirmed a lot of our fears and, and, and we're, we are still where we were preseason and we are still, Kind of on the precipice of seeing Pebble get their permit, but there's just there's a lot more out there now. There's a lot a lot more speculation and a lot more guessing going on. But I I think our our path and what we're seeking hasn't hasn't really changed. I don't. This doesn't answer your question at all. <laughs> if you can't tell, it's been a little bit of a a little bit of a whirlwind. Yeah, I can't imagine what it's like going into the fishing season expecting to come out to have a permit in place or you know at least the decision in place. Um, and then not have it, and then have all of these, you know, political mouthpieces coming out, speaking about the mine in different ways, Donald Trump Jr., and then Joe Biden, and it's, you know, then a whole list of, of uh, conservative microphones going off on Pebble, and you're like, what is going on? I mean, it just, it's, you know, how did you react to all of that? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's taken a little bit of a regroup, especially just in the last couple of weeks, um, just to kind of go back and assess, okay, well, where, where are we at? Because you're right, having, having support across the aisles, it seemed like against Pebble, it, it definitely gives me hope that, that, this process could play out in our favor, but at the same time, if we just take a look at where we're at right now, Pebble applied for permits two years ago, Army Corps acted on a just a fast track timeline that all along the process we we felt and we'd stated seemed to be coming from directives, political directives rather than science-based directives that that 
they were really pushing for getting a permit before the end of this administration. And like I said, the bubble tapes completely revealed that that's, that's been the case and that's what we've been living. So where we are right now is on the precipice of a finalization of this fast track process and, and an environmental impact statement that was done with political pressure that ignored so many of the recommendations from federal agencies, state agencies. I mean, the, the environmental impact statement, which is, I mean, <laughs> going back to the 15 years we've been working on this, we've been told all along that the environmental impact statement, the, the NEPA process and, and, and this environmental impact assessment was going to be our opportunity to see what the impacts of Pebble would be and to you know, have our voices heard. And this, this was the opportunity we were told to wait for to engage in the process. So that's, I mean, the 13 years leading up to these past two years, we've really been told this is the time when, when your concerns will be met. And I can tell you that the two years have flown by and our concerns haven't been met at all. I mean, it's, it's just been the most disappointing insulting process to ever try to participate in um and now we've seen that pebble has been influenced i mean we knew at the time but pebble has absolutely been influencing at every step in the way and and pushing for shorter comment periods and and pushing for a quick just a quick permit basically just a quick recap that you know the environmental impact statement was supposed to be a science-based analysis of the environmental impact of the Pebble project. And mm -hmm. uh, it's been roundly criticized from the global science community, largely. Uh, and as you said, different agencies, even parts of the EPA itself, um, calling it into question. So that when it came out, was it late July, early August? Um, when it came out, you know, it was almost a fait accompli to a lot of us who've been watching it but still ignoring you know the fact that they're trying to do this in a uh, an area that is earthquake prone and so whatever toxic cyanide arsenic copper all that stuff that they're trying to house is vulnerable um and you know the 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 political influence in this that was suspected was revealed in the past few weeks. And so that, you know, that, that creates different, different analyses of how to approach this. And I, you know, you, you've recently had some conversations with um, senators about, you know, where they stand on this because they kind of got called out. Um, is there any, any hope coming out of that? Or, you know, how do you, how do you feel on that? I'm, I'm hopeful. Um... And you know both the senators' reactions to the so so just to back up a little bit the the yep. pebble tapes that we're referring to an a independent investigative team basically caught Tom Collier Pebble CEO and Ron Thiessen Northern Dynasty CEO on tape sharing their strategy and their kind of their inside baseball so it's this is a lot of stuff that we've suspected along or already been able to prove through through freedom and information requests from Alaska state governor and, and, and other areas. So we've, some of this was already out there, but this, this was just, you know, Pebble's own words confirming several things that, that are hugely concerning. But one of, one of a couple of the main things that, that they admit to is that they've, you know, they've pushed for a fast track EIS process. They've pushed for this permitting process to roll through and, and they've succeeded in, in a lot of areas. They, our our main complaint and, and some of the agency's main complaints through the permitting process is that the pebbles permit is is made up it's a it's a foot in the door permit and we've been saying that all along and and these i mean pebble on these tapes absolutely beyond reasonable doubt confirm that this is just a 20-year foot in the door proposal to get the permits they need and, and get the project started. And, and at no point has a financial statement ever been required or a financial feasibility study ever been required of that mine. So this is, I mean, this is what we've been saying all along is that this is not what the mine is going to look like. And, and they admit, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt on those tapes, they say like, yeah, this is 180 year, more like 180 or 200 year project. 
And so that's, that's the number one deficiency in the environmental assessment of this is they're, they're just assessing the tip of the iceberg with no plans for the cumulative impacts or the impacts of long-term build out of the mine. And then the second thing that Pebble said on the tapes that is, I mean, the biggest concern, and, and like you mentioned, something we've brought, we've been bringing up since they came out is, is that there, there are actions that could be taken and could have been taken throughout this process by our elected officials that would, that would protect us and actions we've been asking for all along and, and those actions haven't been taken. So in response to these tapes or, you know, after these tapes came out, both, both Alaska Senators Murkowski and Sullivan condemned what was said on the tapes. Tom Collier has stepped down. Ron Thiessen still remains um, in his position, but the both, both senators have, have now stated that they don't believe Pebble Mine can or should happen. They're reacting to the situation in a positive way, but at the same time, the, the thing that Tom Collier says in these tapes that is absolutely true is that inaction is actually helping the mine. So people can say they oppose the mine all day long, but the process is bent in their favor, and now they've admitted to how they've lobbied to bend the process in their favor. And so as long as the process is able to play out, we can't, we can't trust it in any way and and that's why we need we need actual action out of our senators out of epa we need a stop to this process because the process is we already knew the process was inadequate but now we know it's inadequate and corrupted so we've been asking for a halt in the appropriations to allow army corps to take any any further step in this process and then at consistently we've been asking for epa action to use the clean water act to place protections on this area permanently what can those of us in the lower 48 do to try to get involved and and help move the needle yeah well this you know just this right now is is huge i think like like we said the more the more we spread awareness about this and and keep it on people's radar the the less of a chance that pebbles you know clear clear lobbying and tricks would be successful and then like I said, just stopping the process, putting a stop to the process, assuming that this is dead and and that we've won is is really a detriment to us because that's where, you know, as we've we've already been like three quarters of the way, ninety-nine percent of the way to protecting Bristol Bay in the past and, and had things flip on us. So I think just keeping an awareness out there that this is this is barreling forward until we put a stop to it. So that's I mean, that's something that it doesn't matter if you live in Alaska or, or anywhere you live, you can support you know, a, a halt to this permitting process. And, and that can be done by calling, you know, calling your senators, calling the, the House has already actually passed language that would put a halt to this process. So really all we need is state senators to support that. And that's, you know, that's what we're calling on Alaska senators to do. Senator Cantwell in Washington has already come out to halt the process and, and calling for an investigation to Pebble's dealings here too. I mean, that's, yep. I, don't, I don't think just because you know, some great investigative work was done and we got a behind the scenes look, I think over the course of two days, conversations that were had with a potential investor, what, what Pebble thought was a potential investor, that's, that's just what they admitted to on tape in two days. I mean, that, that's also gotta be the tip of the iceberg. I think their, their influence and their actions over the years have, should be called into question and should be investigated. So I, I think Senator Cantwell's calls for investigation are completely appropriate. Absolutely. And that, we're going to share some resources for people who want to get involved, get engaged and, you know, check in and, and make their voices heard uh, shortly. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for taking, you know, time. I know how busy you are. Thank you so much for giving audience to this. And I, I mean, I guess the, the standing thing that people can do is, is just to continue to appreciate and eat wild salmon I, I think as long as we're right in this fight and and I, I think that that goes a long way being right doesn't always isn't always enough so I think just you know right. keeping keeping a strong economy and a strong answer the one pebbles one argument for decades now has been that we need jobs and and this region needs jobs and, and the governor recently weighed in to say the same thing and and the myth that they're perpetuating is that we can have both the large, world's largest open pit sulfide mine and the fishing jobs in the economy that we already have. And it, you know, the answer, the answer to that is absolutely, we can't have both. And so if you're going to choose, I think just keeping, 
keeping the fishery as strong as possible and, you know, continuing to eat wild salmon and stay educated on where your salmon come from. And chances are, especially this year, Bristol Bay had a strong run. If you're eating wild salmon, they came from Bristol Bay and just, you know, continuing to support our economy and the real jobs and, you know, the real economy that exists now rather than this pie in the sky mine that, you know, truly hopefully never happens. Yeah, the, 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 the resource itself supports a $1.5 billion economic output. You know, that's just the resource itself, the fish returning and 14, 15,000 jobs. So, you know, that's a lot more than what the mine would, would produce. So absolutely. I mean, this, like I said, what happens in Bristol Bay has repercussions down below because if this mine gets permitted, it means that whatever science would go into an environmental impact statement gets thrown out the window for whatever project happens. So again, thank you for being a consummate salmon warrior <laughs> and for, you know, um, sharing your perspective and for just dedicating so much of yourself to something that is important to all of us, this, this resource. So, yeah. Ditto, thank, and thank you. Um, so yeah, so we've been speaking with Kat Karskallen, uh, captain of uh, the Seahawk, a drift netter out of Dillingham. Um, she's also executive director of Commercial Fishermen for Bristol Bay. I'm going to share a screen here that has some resources for everyone to take a look at. Um, this is, you know, this will have some, uh, information about where to go to get uh, how to take action to stop pebble mine now will um it has a, a place where you can sign on to ask for a veto an outright veto which would stop this thing eva's wild which is mark titus's uh website for his film the wild and the breach um and then some background here including down at the bottom where the pebble tapes are that that cat referred to um so you can really see kind of the, um, the sort of blind ambition that, uh, and, and arrogance that went, is going into driving this, this mind forward. So thanks again for joining the One Fish podcast. I'm Carla Stoll, president of One Fish Foundation. We'll see you next time. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Yeah.